This is podcast 1.4 for chemistry, and we're going to talk about measurement in the lab and also scientific notation. So measurement in the lab, there's qualitative and quantitative data or qualitative and quantitative measurements. They really mean the same thing. Um, qualitative is non-numerical observations. So for example, if we were looking at maybe the solution right here, if I wanted to make qualitative observations about it, I would say things about its color or maybe um, if there is a precipitate that I see anything that doesn't require me to take a measurement that uses numbers. Quantitative is where that comes into play, the number part, it's numerical. So a quantitative observation might be the volume of the solution that we're looking at. It might be the temperature of the solution, or maybe it's the mass of the precipitate once we've filtered it out and dried it. All these things require us to use numbers, and numbers go with the quantitative, you can remember it because it has an N, and then qualitative are your non-numerical observations. So you're just making observations about color, precipitate, what did you see happen while the reaction was taking place. The other thing that goes along with that is accuracy and precision. Accuracy is how close you are to the accepted value. Uh, for example, water has a density of one gram per milliliter. If you're trying to prove that, if your answer is close to one gram per milliliter, then we would say you were really accurate. And then in the lab, you usually run more than one trial. And if your trials are close, so say you got 0 0.9, 1.1, 0 0.95 grams per milliliter on your three trials, we would say you were really precise and accurate. Precision is how close you got to your other measurements. It's, is it reproducible? Accuracy is how close do you get to the accepted value, what we know to be true. So if we look at this chart down here, it has four different diagrams to kind of visually explain the difference between these. We're assuming that since this is a bullseye, we're going to want to hit in the middle on all of these. That's the target. So low precision, low accuracy. It's low accuracy because you're not anywhere close to the bullseye. Low precision because all of these red dots are not anywhere near each other. So you don't have either accuracy or precision. You would have a high accuracy here because they're all centered around where it's supposed to be, but your precision is low because they're still not really close to each other. They're all around the place. Here you would have both. You would have both accuracy and precision. All of your measurements are really close to the target, and they're all very close to each other. And then in this last picture, you can see that they're all grouped up here. So you were really precise in that the fact that your measurements were all close, but you weren't very accurate because you didn't get very close to the bullseye. And we care about accuracy and precision because of the glassware that we use and the instruments and the equipment that's in the lab. What we're looking at here is an example just using um, equipment that measures volume. So I have all these different pieces of equipment, glassware, and what we can see is these are burettes, and burettes are the tubes that are hanging on the back wall of the lab. But we know that burettes are very, very accurate and precise when it comes to measuring out a certain amount of volume. So they are better at measuring volume than these volumetric flasks. These volumetric flasks are only for one volume. Um, you could have a 500 milliliter volumetric flask. You could have a 200 milliliter volumetric flask. This line right here, so it's calibrated for only one volume. And you have different sizes depending on what you need. And these are a little less accurate than the burettes, but they are more accurate than a glass pipette, which is more accurate than a graduated cylinder, which is more accurate than a beaker. So what you use in the lab also affects how precise or accurate you are and in the end will affect your measurements and how close you get to the accepted value. All right, when we are doing these measurements and in chemistry in general, there are atoms that we deal with and that's usually what it is and they're really, 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 really tiny. So we have to deal with a really big amount of them. And in, to do that, we use scientific notation. 
And just to kind of give you a quick perspective on how big atoms are, um, if we assumed that the nucleus of the atom, and if you'll remember, we have the nucleus of the atom and it has the protons and the neutrons, and that's in the very center. And then around it, you have the electrons. So we're saying that the marble is just the nucleus, then the electrons would fill an area the size of a stadium. So we're talking about things that are really tiny because they are mostly empty space, but it doesn't appear that way to us. So things that are really, really tiny, we need a lot of them in order to deal with them in the lab. For example, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get rid of this. Well, we're just going to have to go with it. All right, so for example, we have um, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. This is one mole. So one mole of anything has 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles or things. And this is that number written out regularly. Now, we very often deal with a mole of molecules or a mole of atoms, but we don't want to write the number out like this. So scientific notation lets us take this huge number and write it really quickly and efficiently. In general, a rule you should follow is if your number is bigger than 1,000 or smaller than .001, that's when you need to use scientific notation. All right, so we're going to move the decimal so it is right behind the first non-zero number. That's how you know to do scientific notation. And then the exponent is the number of places that the decimal was moved. So, for example, let's just make up a number. We'll just say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If there is not a number here, we assume the decimal, or not a decimal, we assume that the decimal falls right behind the last number. So if I were to take this, one, two, three, four, I moved it four places, so I would rewrite it with my decimal moved to the new place. And then it says the exponent was the number of places that I moved the decimal. So times 10 to the fourth. And then if I look, if my number is bigger than 1, which that one was because it was 12,345, then I have positive exponent. If my number would have been a decimal number to start with, then I would have had a negative exponent. But we're going to practice this on the next slide. So here we go. Um, it says convert the following numbers to scientific notation. I have 700. There's no decimal. I put it at the end. I want to bump it so it's right behind the 7. So this would be 7.00 times 10. I moved it two places, and since this number was bigger than 1, it stays as a positive 2. On this one, the decimal is out here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I need to move it five places. And since this number is smaller than 1 to start with, it was a decimal, this should be a negative 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4. So this would be 3.8 times 10 to the fourth. And then we would go 1, 2, 3. So 5.4 times 10 to the negative third this time. 1, 2, 3, yeah. Negative 3 because that is a decimal number to begin with. And then here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 8 times 10 to the negative 10th. And on this last one, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This would be 4.5 times 10 to the 6th. And that's positive 6 because this number is bigger than 1. All right, convert the following numbers back into regular notation. They're giving us the scientific and want us to go back into just the regular notation. So 1.26 times 10 to the fourth. I want to look at this. Since it's positive, that means I had a number that was greater than 1 to start with. So my decimal needs to come back. I need to make it a bigger number. So this would be 1, 2, 3, 4. What you do is you have your number here and you want to bump it four places so I go one two three four and where I don't have anything is where I'm going to add my extra zeros so this becomes 12,600 this one is a negative three since it's negative that means I had a number less than one I had a decimal 
one, two, three. Again, where I don't have anything, I need to add zeros. So I'm going to put a point out here to start with and then my decimal. I think sometimes if you don't do that, your decimal point gets lost and people sometimes don't know that it's there. So I like to put a zero out in front before I start my decimal. And then we had two, seven, zero, six. Five places, and we need to make it bigger than one. One, two, three, four, five. So this one's going to require three zeros. So that's your number. Bigger than one because it's a positive two. So that decimal just ends up right behind the three, and I don't need to add any zeros. And on this last one, it's a negative nine. And this first jump will take it right in front of the six, and then I need eight more jumps, which means I'm going to need eight more zeros. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, six, seven, eight. And that's your number for number five. And that's it. So we're going to practice these in class. Make sure that you can go to scientific notation and back pretty easily. We're going to use that definitely for the rest of the year.